All right. Well, welcome everyone. I am Sarah Hanawald, Assistant Head of School at One Schoolhouse and really excited about today's webinar. I'm gonna share some slides with you and we will get started. And I'll just remind everybody to use the Q&A for questions and the chat for sharing resources as we go forward. So I'm gonna share my screen here. And today's webinar is focused on the stories our data tell us. And just based on some responses I've gotten from the newsletter, I know that this is a topic that our academic leaders community is very interested in. So whether you're watching this live or recorded, thank you for joining us today. So Joel, you are, you just finished your first year as the upper school director and uh, what a first year. So do you mind just telling everybody a little bit about you and yourself and then I'll get us started here? Sure, thanks, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm Joel Sohn, he, him. I'm the director of upper school at University Prep in Seattle. This is my first year. This is the completion of my first year um, at UPrep. I was previously the director of community and equity at Episcopal High School in Alexandria, Virginia, a 100% um, boarding school just, um, just across the Potomac River from Washington, DC. Um, I guess that's the briefest introduction. Anything else, Sarah? Well, I'm gonna, that's because I'm gonna dive into the questions. That's, that just kind of gives everybody, um, I think a, a feel for your connection to this community and then the independent school academic leadership. So I'll just remind everybody on our website, I have a blog that I wrote based on my prep, preparation with Joel, some really interesting insights that he gave. And then I added a just not insightful commentary, but just, you know, my thoughts as well. So you're welcome to um, take a look at that and push back. And then next week's webinar, we're going to talk about place-based learning, especially this summer as we all, for the first time, get a chance to go out and be in some different spaces. We'll think about place-based learning. I want to just remind everybody, independentcurriculum.org, you can download our advanced independent curriculum standards. So thank you. Um, take a look. And then Joel, this is one reason we kept the introduction short. I'm really interested in your thoughts on this. This week's survey, every week we send a survey out in our newsletter. And this week's question was, what data do you examine or collect to support DEIB initiatives? And we've got some preliminary results and I'll drop the link into the chat and we'll also have it posted on the, our YouTube channel. So if you're watching this, please contribute to the survey. Initial responses. So what do folks look at when they're thinking about DEIB initiatives? And so Joel, when you saw this, um, I know you had a chuckle. <laughs> you said, aha, I see some things in there that I recognize. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I will put that link in for everyone who's interested in participating. So Joel, when you think about this kind of question of, you know, how do we get interested in looking at data and then how do we get more intentional about how we look at it? Yeah, thanks Sarah. The, as soon as you pop, pop that up, I, I wasn't that surprised and I think that's why I chuckled because the number one thing that people are tracking or at least are interested in tracking is demographics, right? And I think particularly with um, a push for schools to be more anti-racist, for schools to be more thoughtful about the work they're doing with their uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging initiatives, um, demographics is at top of everyone's mind. Um, and that's in many ways how most people get invested in looking at their school communities um, is this demographic question. The thing with the demographic question for me is that it's also the easiest thing to track. It doesn't actually take very much time because you have this demographic information. Almost every single independent school tracks demographics based upon um, biological sex, gender expression, um, uh, 
geographic region, uh, you know, here at, at UPREP, we track by zip code and neighborhood. At Episcopal, we track by states, like what states and what, you know, geographic locations are they coming from? Um, we track by all kinds of demographics in terms of um, eth ethnicity, race, um, you know, family composition. And so those things are out there and they're very easy to find, but they don't really tell us much. Those are just numbers in a vacuum. And so when people say we're tracking demographics, my, all, my other question is always generally why and what story do you think it's going to tell you? Um, oftentimes I think we think about demographics as telling us a certain thing about our school. Like if we reach 45% students of color, if we reach 55% students of color, right? That means something about us as an institution. And I don't really know what that means at all. And so I'm always curious about hearing from heads of schools and other academic leaders. Well, what are you hoping to uncover with those demographics? So when you ask that why question, do, are there answers that are typical or do you get sometimes kind of a uh -oh look? Sure, I think I get some people that get flustered by it because they think the easy answer is, well, it tells us something about our DEI initiatives, right? And I'm like, I don't actually think it tells you anything about your DEI initiatives. It tells you a lot about your gatekeeping protocols. Who do you let in? Who do you not let in? Who do you hire? Who do you not hire? That's all it says. And it's, it doesn't even say the reasons why, the reasons of you know the what and the how behind it. It just says, here's who's in the building, right? And I think that's what's really interesting to me is that demographics don't tell us much except these people are in our building. And so that's where you really need to start digging deeper into the questions with, with individuals and with the community at large about what are we trying to get at with these numbers. Yeah, okay, so then you started thinking about, well, I'm presuming the, the why yourself and started thinking about, well, how can I be more intentional with this? Yeah, so that's when I started saying, okay, we already have this information. We have a lot of information. And what do I need to know about um, our community that's going to help us stay focused with the mission? And one of the things I've always talked about is that data means nothing unless you're mission driven and that the data story that you're trying to tell aligns with your mission. And so it's not enough to collect a lot of data because schools have tons of data, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of what is the narrative we're looking at? What is the story we're trying to tell? And how does this support us in doing the mission of the school, right? This is like um, actionable items that, you know, boards want, you know, well, great, here's our numbers. If you just look at numbers, you know, the board or any academic leader can point at it and say, oh no, we need to do something about this. And the question, well, why? Why do we need to do something about it? What is it that you're thinking, your thought process that tells you that that number, that demographic number is, is, a, is a concern? Um, and so what we started to do is, is look for um, areas of student life or or areas of student life stories that we thought told us things about what was actually happening through those demographic numbers. Um, and that's how I got really interested in taking data and slicing it in different ways, examining it in different ways, and then um, trying to tell the story with that data, both with qualitative data and with quantitative data. The quantitative data was the easiest part. It was the qualitative mm -hmm. data that was the hardest part. So, okay, that leads to something that you said that I wanna dive into a little bit. You said schools are full of data and there's a lot of data around, but sometimes I feel like people will tell me, well, I don't really have the information to do that. So, so would you think that they need to consider that a little bit differently? Yeah, I mean, I think schools, schools would be either kidding themselves or being a little bit obtuse if they say, well, we don't have that information. Um, we have all kinds of information. We report it to the NIAS oftentimes or to our association, <laughs> right? We report it everywhere. I mean, we have data on faculty salary. We have data on faculty tenure. We have data on application numbers, retention numbers. We have data on, you know, um, 
what, you know, our yield numbers. We have data on discipline. We have data on student, you know, student issues. Data is everywhere. How many times a student arrives late, leaves early, goes to the nurse, you know, all those things we have information on. It's just a matter of someone, generally, you know, someone with a really deep interest in it, collecting it all and figuring out, okay, what is the story? All of this disparate data yeah. from different areas of student life, from different areas of the school, tell us about what we're doing and are we actually living up to the mission of our school? Yeah, so can you give um, just maybe a story or a time when you've realized that if I, if I go on this seeking journey and I, and I have a question in mind, how did I, how did I go through that process? Yeah, I, I would say you can't do this in year one. <laughs> um, so, so while I definitely Fair have data enough. Prep, Especially right? not this year. Yeah, I definitely have data right. to prep. It, it didn't, it was me just collecting information. But at Episcopal, what I was able to do was I was already a couple of years into being a faculty member there, working you know, with a lot of different people. Um, and talking about data kind of publicly, talking about data, you know, individually with people in different areas of school um, and just what they were doing. Um, I always did it in my student practice because I used to, you know, I used to teach in a Catholic school um, and I used to teach like six sections of AP, AP Lit and AP Lang, 180 students. And one of the things I learned there is that while I didn't like the test and I didn't necessarily like that experience, data, the data from that test and the data from the student experience and the feedback from the student experience informed my practice on how to shift things to improve student outcomes in the future and to improve student feelings in the future. Um, and so I talked about that a lot um, in schools. So at Episcopal, um, it took probably until my second or third year to actually start to ask questions to individuals in different areas of school life to ask them, what are you looking at? What information do you have? How could we improve that and work together to think about what the story is that's actually coming out of there? Mm -hmm. Part of that was we had already begun talking about a new strategic plan, right? And so anytime your school is about to enter a self-study, a strategic plan, or is thinking about a new strategic plan, it's a great time to go in and say, well, before we even think about what we're hoping to accomplish, shouldn't we identify areas of growth for us by looking at what we know about our current school? And I think oftentimes we, we make assumptions about our school without really having a lot of good data to back those things up. And I think that's where I was able to go in and say, hey, student life, hey, dean of students, hey, you know, um, student support systems, hey, you know, health system, hey, um, library system, hey, admissions. What are you all saying, right? What's happening in your world? Can I come and just observe your meetings? Can I observe what's happening here? Can I think about this? Um, and doing that. And it wasn't for them to feel that I was overseeing anything. It was for me to partner with them and to, for me to just say, here's what I observed. And then how do we work together? Um, to, to learn what those observations for me mean and what those observations for you mean. And it was always for me a partnership of, of learning because I didn't know how our admissions team worked because I didn't know how our dean of students work. I didn't know how our, we, I think we called it like um, community weekends and those things worked. Mm -hmm. So I just had guesses. I had you know anecdotal evidence, but I didn't actually fully understand the whole picture. And so if you go in with questions and part, you know, desire to learn, I think that opens up relationships. And then you can get a lot of information from people in, in, you know, with the understanding that trust was happening and that we were always being working together for the mission of the school. So when we talked, one of the things that you shared about the importance of those relationships was that sometimes there is data that is not quantitative, but is very qualitative and very valuable. And that relationship was key to getting access to some of that information. Can you explain that a little bit for our, for our folks here? Sure, so 
quantitative data is generally easy to get a hold of because it's just hold card facts, or at least we believe they're hold card facts. Um, <laughs> There's yeah. a book about that, right? How yeah. do I was statistics. <laughs> you know, um, we believe that to be true. And so they could just give me numbers, you know, hey, tell me how many kids are, how many kids are being reported for quote unquote dress code violations, right? Great, mm -hmm. I got that information. Well, that doesn't really tell me much about this. Like it just tells me basic numbers, but I don't know much about this. Do we have other information? And so it actually took me to sit down with like the assistant dean of students and the dean of students to be like, tell me, who is doing this? Tell me who is being reported. Tell me who is reporting. Tell me, you know, how long this has happened. Tell me, you know, the stories about this person. Is there a history behind this? You know, when did that begin? So just always asking mm -hmm. a lot more questions about the people behind it, about the why behind it, um, actually surfaced a lot of interesting narratives about uh, the the faculty that were reporting, right, the most for discipline and dress code violations, the faculty that were reporting the most for like absences or lateness. And I was like, I know more kids are tardy, right? I know more kids are late, but they aren't being reported. So who's not being reported? Why is that not being reported? And what does this tell us about maybe our lens on who should be reported, who should not be reported? So it was actually yeah, that is super important. Questions. yeah, to get a lot of narratives about kids and relationships with students. Yeah. And I'm thinking, um, I don't want to oversimplify this, but let's take the tardiness example. So what you don't know when you look at the tardy data is how many kids were late and not reported, and, or even how many kids are on time? Some people will make an assumption. We'll take the late data, we'll subtract it from all of them, and then we'll know how many kids are showing up on time. But we don't really know that, do we? No, <laughs> you don't really know that. And then, <laughs> I mean, and and it was also interesting because people, you know, it was interesting for me to see this this response because it was demographics. Demographics was number one. It was what was it? Eighty percent. Right? We're tracking demographics or hopefully right. demographics. But under things like discipline, like we just had this number, here's who's being reported, right? And so when we went back a couple of years and said, okay, do we actually have demographic information on that? And they're like, well, we have student names, but we don't have demographics attached to that. I was like, well, that's probably easy because we have the student names, we can go back and add all kinds of demographic information we want on that. So now it's not just like 10% of our students are being reported late or 10% of our students are being reported for these dress code infractions. Now we have, okay, of that 10%, 80% of them are this or 70% of them are this, right? And there were right. clearly, right, um, demographic uh, stories coming out of that. There were stories being told, right? Or at least partial stories being told. I wanna be careful with that, right? wasn't the complete, there was a partial story being told that the kids that were often being reported the most, right, for dress code infractions, right, were boys, which is a really interesting thing, right, for lateness, it was yeah. boys, right, um, and oftentimes it's students of color, and so you're just like, okay, so if that is what the data shows, is that the truth, you always have to go back, is that the truth, or is that factually based, right, is quote unquote truth, because all of that is relative. Do we go back and we ask questions about why, um, what's happening, who's doing the reporting, right? Um, because clearly, again, our reporting systems weren't so great that we knew that 100% of our kids were being reported for exactly being on time or not, right? So what is the story this, this is going to tell us? Or what are the things that this is telling us? What are trends? And data isn't perfect. I, I think I've talked about this in my in a presentation before was data is imperfect. We also think like we our data has to be absolutely clean and absolutely perfect. There's no such thing, right? It's it's never perfect. And so trends are good enough for us to start to say, huh, what is this telling us? How do we then think about this? Is this a big enough concern that we want to address it? And then mm -hmm. how do we go about addressing it? 
So when someone responds to you by saying not to that statement, but if they say, well, this data isn't really perfect, so I probably can't generalize, how do you help them? Because I think this is really good advice for academic leaders. How do you help someone see that, no, this is actionable and there are some things we can do? Um, it depends on how large the data set is. For me, mm -hmm. you know, people say, well, we didn't, you know, we didn't get a hundred percent response. Okay, well, you got 90% response. You maybe you got 70% response, you know, in a in a really poor poll, maybe you only got 40% response. Is that actionable data? Well, sure, it's actionable data in a way that tells you as long as you go about it and then you know that it's telling you a partial story, but it's telling you a trend of the people that have responded, which is a subset of the people in your school, right? Those are the people who are mm -hmm. likely invested in the school or likely invested in what's happening or what the question is about. Um, of those people, is there a trend? Yes, there's a trend. Okay, now we've identified that there is a trend does this apply to other people? And the, the thing is that when you take that data set and you come out of it with seeing a trend, you say, okay, what do we do with that? So if it's not, if it's not perfect data, if it's not even you know, the majority of the people you're saying, okay, well, if only 40% of the people responded, but 70% say this, that's not a majority of your school yet, right? So how do you right. go? Well, then you bring in constituents. So what we did, as we had all the student life data and we, we had a lot of data about who was signing up for activities and who was not signing up for activities. And it wasn't perfect data because we couldn't track how many kids were signing up. It wasn't 100% of the kids signing up or not signing up. It was whoever did or whoever filled it out, even though we knew mm -hmm. other people were participating, right? We just couldn't have that. Right. But what the data did tell us was a certain trend was emerging, great. So who then are the people that talk about that trend? And is this trend something that we should, we should address? Well, clearly the Dean of Student Lives, the you know, director of some a director of you know, community events or you know, student life activities, um, you know, our, our assistant head for student life, right? Um, we probably are student representatives who are who are creating those activities. They should probably be involved mm -hmm. in the conversations. Um, you know, the, our DEI team should be involved in those conversations. Um, you know, who else needs to be involved? Our, our chaplain, because they run summer programs, should be involved in that conversations. Our athletic directors, because they run co-curricular programs, should be involved in those conversations. So even though they might not have been factored into that data set, and even though their areas of life might not have been factored into that data set, their lens of all coming from different angles of school life can actually contribute to the conversation about what trend that might be, what story that trend might be telling us. And then you also get community yeah. buy-in by involving a lot more people. So I really like the way that you describe, and let me just make sure that I was listening well and summarize. So you have some data that indicates that there may be a trend and you think this is something that I wanna investigate and know more about. So you seek multiple perspectives and you look at, um, both those who are really close in. So I'm thinking about the students who are involved in the student activities. And then at the same time, those who are further out who are tr maybe tracking big picture, you know, what's our range of activities. And you put all of that together with the data. So then you've got a clear picture and then you've got a story. And you talk about the power of story when you're communicating maybe to a board, to a parents group, to an advisory panel, maybe you're, you know, in the community looking for, um, participation or funding in something. So then when you're telling that story, how do you put it back together? So what I found is convincing people, right? And, and I noticed this on leadership teams and I've noticed this on um, in other spaces where we're looking at student issues and student concerns. And we always do that thing and teachers do this all the time, right? In, in like the, the faculty work room where where teachers get together and say, oh, I'm having a concern with a student, right? This reminds me of, and the, the person will always say, or another teacher might say, oh, do you remember so-and-so? Do you remember how they, and then they talk about this trajectory, right? Oh, they did this thing. And then, they, and 
what I remember thinking is like the power of narratives tied to students who are near and dear to our heart, right? Um, moves people more than numbers. Stories move people more than numbers because numbers just show information and bits and people will find their own narratives in those numbers unless you paint them. Mm -hmm. And so what you need to do is kind of find that hook, right? It's like a thesis statement. So the thesis statement, right, for me was the number one in our data, for example, in this one particular sense uh, issue of our data was the number one users of our, the number one, you know, people who are invested in our weekend activities are female students of color who are on, who, um, who come from families that are on financial aid. And so even though I didn't single it out to a single student narrative, I could tell them, this is what the demographics paint a picture of that our top students that are using our weekend activities are our female students, students mm -hmm. of color who are on financial aid. And then I would kind of let them process that information and say, Super important processing what, time. What does that tell us? What do you think is the reason why they are our number one users, right? And it, for me, that was a great conversation because people were like, oh, is that a problem? Like, you could actually hear people say, is that a problem? Is that a concern? Should we be concerned about this? I said, I don't know. I'm saying this is what it is. Mm -hmm. Is that something that we want to talk about? Is this something we want to address? And, you know, another one of the one of the Dina students said, from my lens, actually, what I'm seeing, and they, and they, you know, they worked on dorms and stuff, and and on boys' dorms was. This doesn't tell us the complete picture because I know our boys are staying on campus and are invested in the community, but in different ways. And I said yes. So let's learn about that story, mm -hmm. right? And this so is also why you have. need so many people in the room that are in different pockets of student life, because that wasn't being talked about, right? That. Mm -hmm. boy community at that age on our campus was very different, right? It was much more driven by video games and communal time together, which is a productive thing for boys to be invested in. Like they were like, oh, well, they're not working right. together. They're not doing, I was like, no, they're in their rooms playing games together. They go to the gym and work out together. They go do this. And like what we see is they're finding their own ways into building community with each other rather than finding the school ways of dictating how community is gonna be done. And then I could say, right. and what does that then still tell us about this group who is needing us mm -hmm. to build the community a certain way for them to find entry ways into the whole community? Is that something we right. still want to be addressing? So now you know something about the formal participation, the informal ad hoc community building, and you can look for who's not included and think about, is it a new pathway that's needed? Do we need to illuminate a pathway for them because they're not able to find it? Like, that's a much different question. I think about, um, there's a, a powerful TED talk, the power of a single story. And I think a story to really enter academic leaders' brains who are creative thinkers. We like to solve other people's problems. And you mentioned processing time. Sometimes we need to sit with it a little bit and marinate before we jump to, which I probably just did, you know, do we need to do this? Do we need to do that? Um, yeah. So I have more questions, but I wanna make sure I at least offer up. Folks, if you've got a question, put it in the Q&A and um, we'll try to get that in. So um, what I'm really interested about is when you think of advice that you have for other academic leaders, what is something that they should look to uncover? And I don't mean what problems do they have that, that you know they have that they don't, but what do you think they might seek to uncover if they're interested in finding out what's available on campus that maybe I'm not leveraging? How would they go about uncovering that? Um, 
So I, it, it really depends on the school. I will say the area that I think you can learn the most about, right? Um, in, I kind of, I, don't, I kind of worry about this, but um, the reason why I worry about it is because it, I think it often is an area fraught with anxiety and danger for the community, right? Um, but the area I will say that I'm really interested in is um, student narratives and then student surveys, right? Um, because those are qualitative stories, right? Um, one of those places where you can get student narratives, right? And I think sometimes, you know, school leaders just kind of shrug it off and kind of chuckle about is the student newspaper. And if you have a good journalism program in school, the student newspaper is a place where you should really dig in and be like, what's on students' minds? Um, and especially in places where they might not have formal ways to evaluate or give feedback to teachers, right? But if you do have that feedback to teachers, I think that's a really healthy place to look and, and to hear and to read. It takes a lot of time to read through comments, but they're really important because they're giving you just enough data to say, hmm, I think something's happening here, right? Who is this mm -hmm. kid? Who is this person, right? We don't always know that because it's generally anonymous surveys, but are there trends emerging that students are saying, I'm not feeling this, or I am feeling this. And the other place I think is really intriguing to me to look at is student narratives. It's the teacher comments about students. And oftentimes in independent schools, we have those at the quarter or the semester. But for me, I read a lot of them. I, I read as fast as I can through a lot of them because they tell me a lot about what language do we use as educators to engage with students and to engage with certain types of students, right? Um, and this is when, um, you know, when I first got to an institution that used student narratives and really long student narratives, um, I started looking at my own comments and being like, ooh, like if I was that kid, I would feel really bad hearing that from a teacher, right? Um, I used to use the word like, I wish you would uh, speak up more. Oh, that's kind of a coded yeah. language, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, those kinds of things. And who was I saying that to often, more often than not? Was I being, you know, culturally mindful about that stuff? Um, was it coming from a place of like gender bias? I don't know. I just wanted to start saying, oh, right. And then so that's when, when I got to Episcopal and I started looking at comments and I started being like reading other people's comments and saying, oh, you know, when you say that, you know, I had a student say, for example, uh, a, a parent, I'm sorry, a, te a teacher say, well, you know, it's, it's just an A minus versus an A. It's not that big of a deal. And I was like, ooh, like, let's, let's talk about why that's a really good that. language. And in particular, you're talking about this student who comes from a different cultural background where that is a huge deal. And mm -hmm. while you and I may feel like it's not that huge of a deal, right? When you verbalize that to a student in your comment, right? That now is going to other places. That's going to, right? Places. you know, that's on our report cards. They're like, how does that go to another teacher, right? To their advisor, right? And so what is the impact of that comment in other places? And so I actually think it, the, 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 the qualitative data of student narratives and the qualitative data of student, student feedback to, to teachers is really important for academic leaders to look at. It's a lot more time consuming, but it can tell you a lot about where students feel, especially if it's the only outlet for, for how students can give you feedback. Well, I think that is, <clears throat> excuse me, a great charge for us as we exit to think about really diving into some of the narrative data sources that we have. And uh, Damien Bebel, who I've interviewed before, is a researcher at Boston College. And he suggests taking text and developing your own little code and then tracking how often different pieces of text represent um, certain outcomes. You know, are mission references made within certain pieces of text. And I'm gonna get in over my head pretty quickly because I am not 
a PhD researcher on this level, but maybe that's the, the call to action is to think about reading those narratives with an eye towards how is this data rather than simply a narrative. Yeah. Yeah. When, you know, when I sat in the rooms with emissions, um, I, I did track language use around demographics. Um, one of them, you know, one week I spent, and I didn't tell them I was tracking it, but I knew I was tracking it, right? Was in reading the files and the, in the, and the comments on the files, right? Was uh, language related to gender, sweet girl, good guy. The number of times that that was coded in a certain way or came up in conversation, which to me, like, I was like, that, that doesn't tell me anything about this student, right? That's applying to come in. But the number of times it came up, mm -hmm. when I pointed it out, they were like, oh, oh, like, that's a lot. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's a lot. Right. And I'm not saying it's, a, I'm not saying it's a problem. What I'm saying is that came up a lot. What does that tell us? Do we think it's a problem? Do we want to do something about it? Can you talk about it? Can you become more bias aware so that if you do think it's a problem that you are realizing that that might be code for something that not everyone understands is actually a thing, right? So like, what does sweet right. girl mean? Like, what does that tell us about the applicant? That That's such a, <laughs> that what it means for you. Such is so a loaded term. You and, you know, <clears throat> and I think that's where you have to be okay also, you know, if I can only take in, you know, like, what is it? Like 16 bits of information versus, you know, the billions of bits of information I'm receiving. Mm -hmm. I have to, to filter out a lot of stuff and say, okay, I'm only looking at this, right? And then another week I spent only, only reading and only looking at how are they reading and how are they talking about international Asian students, right? Um, right, so developing a lens as you go in and we are, we're out of time. So oh. we run over a little bit, but, I, but it was totally worth it. <laughs> um, but I wanna thank you so much for, for this. And, um, and folks, you have your assignments. So if you're watching the recording of this um, and you're at your desk, maybe start gathering some reading material. So thank you so much, Joel. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone.